So we've got here an Atari Lynx 2 that has a strange screen issue. So let me just show you um, the issue. We've got a game in and we've got a speaker in. And we'll just bypass everything. So we're just going to power it from um, a power bank. And instead of having the ribbon in and all the front case and everything, we can just short out uh, TP17 to TP18. Turn the console on. If we turn the screen over, you can't see anything on the screen yet, but you should hear the game load in a second. Now you can see how the screen does a reset, so it's getting the reset pin. You can see the contrast works, but there's no data on the screen. There is a tiny bit of, see this like red flickering down the bottom. So we want to identify what's causing this issue and how to fix it. Now, most of you will know Retro6.wiki, the website we have with loads of information about diagnosing and fixing problems. There's not much at all on the Atari Lynx yet. In fact, I don't even think I have a section on the website. So no, we don't even have an Atari Lynx section yet. So what I want to do is add the diagnostic information to the website, obviously, so you guys have something to go by when you need to fix consoles. I haven't worked that much on the LCD circuit of the Atari Lynx yet, so I thought it would be a great time to show you guys how I discover information, how I diagnose problems and identify what needs to be done from having no information at all. So I have information on the power circuit because I did a video on that and reverse engineered it, but I've done next to nothing on the Atari video signals yet. So let's tackle this problem together from the start and let's see how I would formulate a plan to find out what this problem is systematically instead of blindly swapping chips or just looking for broken traces. So the first thing I'd like to do is get a working links. So I have my working links here that fully works, that I know completely and utterly works. And the first thing I'm going to do is put this screen in my working links. You want to try and break down any system into its sort of parts and test them on working consoles first. So if the speaker wasn't getting audio, plug it into a console that you know works with a speaker that you know works first, and then swap it out for the presumed non-working speaker and validate that way. So I'm going to do the same thing here. I'm going to effectively try and validate if the screen is working by using a known working front board. So I've got the same game in this console. I think I've got chips in this console. It's quite a cool game. And if I attach the backlight, which we know works because we can see the backlight, and the ribbon, and then we power up this known working console. When you're working on these, just make sure not to touch any of this area here or this area here when it's underneath. So stay away from the left side of the board. Uh, this will generate hundreds of volts and give you a nasty zap for the backlight. So, you know, avoid that. So let's short TP17 and 18. And let's flip over and see if we see anything. And there you go. So you can see this screen fully works. So we know the issue isn't the screen. So that's the first step. And we don't know anything about the console yet in terms of fixing this problem, but without any knowledge, simply hot swapping parts allows us to see clearly the screen isn't the problem. So knowing that, let's just take the screen back out. And what's the next step then? Well, the way I do it is if the screen's working in a working console, and yet it's not working in this customer's console, then I will start by using an oscilloscope and probing every single one of these LCD pins. And before you do that on a non-working one, if you can, and it's massively beneficial, start with a working one. So we're going to use this working Atari Lynx 2 console. We are going to start up with TP17 and 18, and we probably want to plug in the speaker so we can actually hear something and we know it's working. And then let's wait until we hear the game audio so we know it's working. So there's the game load. So I'm happy the console's running now. So I'll just disconnect this speaker for now. We don't need to hear that while we're diagnosing. But carefully flip over, remembering not to touch this area of the board. Now I can go on the edges fine, but don't touch these three pins here and don't touch any of this circuit here. I've attached myself a ground wire. Now this ground is a switched ground, so this won't be active ground until you turn the console on. If you wanted active ground all the time, then you can go to the battery spring. 
clip the oscilloscope on ground. And I just have PicoScope plugged in here, set to 10 volt plus for now, 50 microsecond division, and a trigger just midway. And what we also want to look at is the schematic of the Atari Lynx. So we know what we're even expecting. So if we look at the schematic here, we can see that we have the power circuit down the bottom, all this area here, which I know is good because we're powering up and gain audio. We have the backlight circuit here, which we know is all good because we see backlight. Then we have all this contrast circuit here that generates the high voltages for the contrast, which is what I'm suspecting at the minute might be the problem. Uh, you have audio here in this block, which is all working because we get audio. You have the backlight on off button, which we don't care about because it's currently working and it's not relevant to the problem. So you've got the ROM cartridge connector and shifters here, which must all be working because again, the game's fully loading, so there's no issue there. And then you have the main uh, Hayato and Susie chips. So the Susie chip handles button presses, and you can tell that by simply looking at the schematic and seeing that it does left fire, right fire, pause, cart, joystick buttons, and then it connects to the RAM. So it's literally handling um, button inputs. So that's what the Susie section does. That's not going to be our issue. It's got nothing to do with the screen. Uh, the ribbon here, which you connect to the front board for turning on and off and pressing the buttons, again, have no concern for the current issue. Expansion connector, no concern. So really, the only focus of interest is the Hayato, which is effectively the main CPU. Uh, the two RAM chips here, which both I suspect are working because we have game audio. But the Hayato is responsible for driving the screen, as we can see by having all the pins here that go through this thick black line, go down, go across, and go into the LCD connector. So we know the Hayato is responsible for driving the screen. And we have a contrast circuit that is responsible for generating the screen's high voltages in order to display the information that's sent from the Hayato chip. So with all that known, what do we actually want to do? Uh, we want to start with simply the LCD connector here. So we have pins here, 26 pins. And they correlate to these 26 pins here, which we know because we plug the screen in here. And we can count the pins and it's 26. I don't know which order is left and right yet. I don't know which is pin 1 and pin 26. But if we look at the schematic, it's pretty easy to figure out. Two of the first pins should be 5 volt on one side. And two of the pins on the other should be ground. So whichever's 5 volt we know is pin 1. And then we work our way down. So with that said, let's just pull up the scope. And let's get probing. So this should already be running. We'll start at this side. And we can see there straight away that's 5 volts. So we must presume... The next pin is 5 volts, which it is. And now let's just carry on down the pins. And as we're doing this, I'll write some notes of what each pin is doing and looks like. Just a self-description of what to expect. So when we come to compare this to the non-working one, we can have something to go by. So the first two are 5 volts. Third one is a pulse. So if there's a pulse, I'm just going to zoom out a little bit, take a measurement. And that's a pulse width of... 3.146 kilohertz so i'll make a note of that next pin is again pulsing they're all five volt pulses at the moment as well zero to five volts this one's pulsing at 12.58 kilohertz this one's pulsing at 25.16 kilohertz this is 6.29 kilohertz so just a bunch of pulses it's not relevant to what this information means right now it doesn't help us with the diagnostics at this step. And if something's wrong, you're likely going to be simply missing all this information. So we'll try to interpret the information as we go. But to start with, we're just going to simply look for missing information altogether. The next pin is a 50 kilohertz constant wave. The next pin is sitting at 2 volts. So let me just turn the contrast wheel. Yeah, so as I suspected, that's similar to the game gear. So this is similar to the A pin on the Game Gear. Um, this goes between 1.4 and 2.7 volt when you move the contrast wheel. So that will be part of the higher voltage generation later, like TPR. Um, I've got a suspicion this is going to be very similar to uh, the Game Gear, just because the names of these pins are very similar. So for example, CL2 is clear line, typically. and it's So that's likely going to be like H-Sync. VD2 is voltage for the... Um, contrast but low voltage typically CLK are clocks so I'm guessing they're all going to be clocks with there being three of them and there's normally three driver chips on the LCD so if we look at the LCD a moment 
you can see three driver chips here, one, two, and three. So the likelihood is that's the same again as the Game Gear. It's likely going to be that each one of these drives independently each driver chip on the screen. Then you've got DL1302. My suspicion is they are going to be data. So that's going to be pixel data, red, green, and blue data, similar to the Game Gear again. Four bit color information. Reset. And it doesn't sound right for a screen, so we'll see what that might be. Then you've got LCD, VDD, VSS, and TPR. Again, that's standard in old LCDs. That will be likely the high voltage pulses that generate the contrast. So I'm making presumptions off knowledge I have of a Game Gear at the moment. But what you'll typically find is most things have the same kind of um, design for the most part in the era. So I'm relying on some knowledge I already have uh, to make presumptions here. But again, none of that's that important right now. Make what presumptions you can and we can correct them in the future as we diagnose more. So if we go down to the next one. We can see here we have some fast pulses. And this is that CL2 pin, which I'm suspecting is H-Sync, which my guess then is these are going to be the start of each line going across the screen. And in which case, this is normally 158 uh, microseconds, if I remember rightly, which is a line. And you can see 158 microseconds here is the time between each one. So that will definitely be a line. And then we have again a floating pin. So if we move the contrast wheel, that goes between 2.2 .2 and 4.4. .4. So again, that will be the backlight contrast circuit, the low voltage side. Then we move on to the clocks. So this is a, a high clock pulsing low. This is a low clock pulsing high. High clock pulsing low. Low to high. High to low. Low to high. So that will mean Bs are clocks that burst low. So they start high and then sink low. And A is the exact inverse of that, which is starts low and pulses high. So you'll get an inverse pulse. So kind of a differential pair. And with it being a clock wire, that's probably why they've done it. Simply a differential pair to um, assist with noise because it allows you to have twice the amount of voltage and you're looking for the difference between the two lines, not the actual voltage. So next up is DL1302. Right, and there's the next one. So that looks just like Game Gear data again. So I'm guessing that if we zoom in a little bit, uh, let's put some advanced trigger on here instead of just a basic one so we can actually uh capture the data just give me a moment to um get this to capture just on a long low there we go so if you see there that's a full line of 150 microseconds so clearly this is data inside the line and it would be something like this it would sort of fall between that's where the data of the screen is written so that's a left to right line data. And if we zoomed in, you can see that's then the data appearing on the screen and it's changing. The next one, next one, and next one. So you can you can tell that is obviously red, green, and blue data. Carrying on down the line, zoom out a little bit. And we have pulses here. This is the reset pin. And to me, this looks like vertical sync, so a frame sync. And yep, based on the time, 16.74 microseconds roughly. That's what I would call a V-Sync. So that means this reset pin isn't reset, it's V-Sync. It's basically we have H-Sync as CL2, V-Sync as reset. So I've made them notes. Next up, we have something going out of voltage. So let's just scale up more and scale up even more. Actually, yeah, let's just remove that advanced trigger for now. We'll go to simple edge again and trigger a little bit higher. So you can see here are high voltage pulses. So it's roughly 22 volts at the minute. So let's just turn the wheel down. And if it's like the Game Gear again, yeah, it is exactly the same. This is the pulses that generate your contrast in your pixels so that you can see the pixels. Do the next pin. And you've got the exact same thing again. And the next pin. And there's your inverted negative contrast pins. And the last two should be ground. That one's 0.7 volts, almost ground. So maybe diode protected ground or something. And that one is ground. So that's the working pins. And as I've done that, I've made notes of what we've just seen and observed. So we've got some useful information now to 
loop back on when we diagnose the next one. So with that said now, let's just disconnect this working console. Let's bring in the currently non-working console. We're going to power it up just the same way. We're going to connect a speaker. We're going to short TP17 to TP18. And then I'm just going to listen for the game loading on the speaker first. And then we'll just disconnect the speaker. And there we have the game loaded. So let's unplug. Flip over carefully without touching any of the high voltage lines. And now all I'm going to do is look for differences in these waveforms. And let's hope we find one. If it is, then all we've got to do is work backwards in the schematic from that pin, go into where things are connected and measure the components there. And without knowing anything about the links whatsoever, you can simply diagnose with an oscilloscope looking for differences in what the signal does, and it will lead you back to potentially the faulty component. So with my notes on screen now, we should have five volts and five volts. If we just turn that back down to plus 10. Yep, five volts, five volts. We should have a 3.1 kilohertz wave, which we do, followed by a 12, which we do, followed by a 25, which we do, followed by a 6.2, which we do, followed by a 50, which we do. And my suspicion there is if you look at them numbers, if you reorder them, you have a 3 kilohertz, then a 6, then a 12, then a 25, then a 50. They're all divisible by each other effectively. So that's probably some kind of um, phase lock loop to generate some pulses that we can use in the clock circuit. But they're all present and good. Next up, we should have a 1.4 to 2.7 circuit, roughly, which we do. There's the H-sync, which is correct. Then we should have the 2.2 to 4.4 circuit, which we do. Now, this is the clocks, so a high pulse to low. And again, I'm just on a different... Uh, Time frame here, we're on roughly that before. So high to low, low to high, high to low, low to high, high to low. And now here's the data pins. So we'll just put back on that advanced trigger. And that looks to me, you know, like, ah yeah, that might be the problem. So notice this data is all solid. There's nothing going on. It's literally outputting the exact same data. Let's go to the next pin. Oh, yeah. Solid data. Solid data just inverting. Solid data. That's not good then. So let's carry on a minute. So the problem here is this data should be changing. So we have, this is actual pixel data, red, green, and blue data. That's what to display on screen. And quite clearly, this... Um, console is telling the screen to actually display that black it's not outputting any data it's just solid data it's literally black effectively so the next pin should be the reset which is the v-sync and if we scroll out we can see that is correct the time is correct 16 milliseconds roughly and now the pins i was hoping were faulty uh yep as suspected now after seeing the data pins there's the contrast circuit perfectly fine, generating 20 plus volts of contrast. And that. And the negative. Yeah. Okay, so. Based on what we've just seen there, we have absolutely identical results um, between the two consoles on the LCD pin. So what does that tell us then? Well, I was hoping the LCD connector was going to give us the clue that something, and typically, like on Game Gears, the contrast circuit might be faulty. Um, or the data might be corrupt. Like, you know, instead of being 5 volts, it's 0.2 volts. In this instance, everything on this board, everything on the LCD pins, is identical to the working console, except the data pins are actually saying to output black. So that's a problem. So with that in mind, where do we go from here? So at least we've got some information on the LCD pin now we can put on the wiki. And say these were faulty, say these um, TPR or VDD or VSS were faulty, all you'd have to do is follow these lines, go back to this resistor, this cap, this transistor, the diodes, and literally work your way backwards through the circuit, probing each point with your oscilloscope on a working board compared to a broken board, and you will eventually find your problem. 
that's what I did on the Game Gear. And if we went to the wiki and went to Diagnostics and LCD Circuit, for example, you'll see here, if you can't be bothered to read, here's the pins, VSS, TPR2, VDD, VM. You'll see these names are similar. You'll also see what they do is similar. So 188 microsecond pulses, uh, 1.4 to 2.6 volt range, minus 18 to plus 18. It's literally the same kind of thing. And that's because the screens are similar. You can see the backlight driver circuit similar. Two caps, two transistors. You can see is literally like this circuit here on the Atari. And those pins go off to very similar places. So it helps that we have the Game Gear diagnostics because it's a very similar um, setup and circuit to the Atari. But in this case, all of that data is correct. And what we've seen is these DL130 and 2 are just simply black data, just constant pulsing solid data. And we know the game's running because if we plug the speaker in, we can literally hear the game loading. So we know the game is running and should be outputting data on the screen. So let's just look at where DL130 and 2 go. So they group into this black line. They come over and we've got to look for them coming off. So keep going. Keep going. Goes up here. Goes across. Goes up here. And you can see then DL0, 1, 3, and 2. You can see DL0, 1, 2, and 3 come here. And they go through a resistor pack here. And into pin 2, 3, 4, and 5 of the Hayato chip. So here is the Hayato chip. You can see written on the silk screen, pin 1, pin 9, pin 10. So strangely on this chip, pin 1 starts in the middle, goes around, pin 43, down and across. So if pin 1's here, we wanted pin... Uh, two, three, four, and five. So that's the next pin, next pin, next pin, and next pin. You can see these four go down through and into RP7 in this case. Now it says on the schematic it's RP5. So it's either a schematic issue uh, with the labeling. So I'm going to trust that it's simply a silk screen issue and RP7 isn't uh, the resistor pack and it is RP5 because we can clearly see it going to pin two, three, four, and five. So to test that theory, let's ignore this board for now. Go back to the working board, which is how we always want to prove the theories. Start with what you know works and look at what's different. Well, as always, just jump start the console, TP17 to 18. And with no indicator, we don't really care. At the minute, we'll just probe and see if we see. And if we do, then that's as much as we need to do. Let's go on this resistor pack on the working console. Bring the system back into the same spec as we saw and there we can clearly see uh, the actual game data so that's those same pins but on this resistor pack and they are definitely those pins we saw so that's the data we are seeing on these resistors so let's now just grab the currently faulty board and do the exact same test and then go to the same resistor pack and yeah, you can see even on this part of the resistor pack, it's exactly the same. So this is coming directly from the Hayato chip. So that's unfortunate because effectively it means this chip, the Hayato, which you can't replace. This is effectively the main core. It's like the A6 on the Game Gear. This is the main core of the console. This is outputting every other signal valid, even the audio, the game loading, everything except the data going out is not actual data. So the fault could either be a bad Hayato chip, which does happen, it's known to happen, or something about this chip isn't receiving the data to push out on those uh, pixel pins. So let's just read what the pins say and see if we have any guesses. So you've got TX and RX going to uh, an extension connector, so it won't be that. These DBL, TPR, and C2s here we know work. The clocks work. The P's work. The audio works. Um, we have color and black and white, which isn't the issue. ROM tape, NeoExp, REST, and VOT Audion. Not sure what they are. The only thing I'm thinking of was maybe a pin on this console that disabled the data output or changed the format. But I don't know of anything at the minute. Um, these are like unknowns, so ROM and tape, 
Not really sure what that is. Maybe it used to load off tape, but I don't think that would affect a screen. It doesn't sound like it. Motor on, no idea. Crystal's a crystal, but let's follow motor on them and see where it goes. Goes into reset of the ROM court. So it's probably a reset for... Um, this, actually, that looks like a toggle for... If it was ROM or tape, I guess it's going to disable the ROMs reading and writing. So I don't think that's anything to do with it anyway. Um, no X. I don't know what that does. Goes out, down, through a resistor and to the extension port. So something to do with no extension port, I guess. That's what that'll probably mean. Rest is pulled up to five volts. And that's the reset pin. So that's the V-Sync probably. So again, it's definitely not that. Power, data, and then RAM access. So all the RAM must work because the game's loading. That has to be stored in RAM. So all these address and data pins must be fully functional because we are literally loading a game. And all these are related to RAM, buzz requests, cast, call, RAS, row. We should find they all go to the ROM chips here, which they do. And they also go to the Suzy chip. So both the Suzy and the Hayato talk to the RAM. So the only thing that I notice here is there's two RAM chips. Now, maybe one's video RAM, maybe one's data. And some things don't have video RAM. So, for example, the Hayato can basically output video data straight onto these pins by simply using the RAM in general, as opposed to having dedicated RAM. The Game Gear, for example, has a dedicated RAM chip that one of the A6 drives. So you can remove that RAM chip and it's completely controlling the screen's data. In the case of the Lynx, I don't think that's the case because if you look at here, this first RAM chip uses data lines 0, 1, 2, and 3. And the next one uses four, five, six, and seven. But there's a quick way to test if either one of these is video RAM. Similar trick on the Game Gear. If we were to short, say, two of these data pins, which is sending data to and from the Hayato chip, if it was video RAM, it wouldn't care what data is sent back on the data pins if they got mixed up, because that's literally going to be telling the screen exactly what to show. So if we just short out, say, data pin five and seven together, on each chip one at a time. If it was game data or more complex data, the system would crash. If it's purely video data, it would literally change what is on the screen and it wouldn't crash. So to do that, uh, pin one is here, the dots, that's pin one. Pin two and three are here. So if we just short them pins, you can hear the game's just crashed. So that chip, which is U4, is clearly needed for loading the games so that's just pure ram and these are all joined directly so all the addresses match so you can't short the addresses because you'd affect both ram chips but the data pins are not joined so we can short out one of the you know the data pins independent of each ram and that's effectively what we're doing here so let's try shorting the bottom chip now on pins two and three let's just wait for game audio again there we go so now let's just short out pin two and three on this chip and again, unfortunately, the game has crashed. So based on that test, and it's a, it's a crude-ish test, um, I think these RAM chips are more general purpose RAM and there is no video RAM on this console. So that means the Hayato is entirely responsible for driving the screen. And that's what's currently outputting bad data on the non-working console. So just for a quick test anyway, let's also uh, probe them with the scope just to see some data. Um, we should see RAM data going on. So there's one of the RAM data pins, the other data pin. And just probing down here, we know this is the working board. If there was faulty data, we would see um, normally mixed signals. So we zoomed in a little bit more on the time frame. You'd see mixed signals. And for example, on these squares, None of these squares are mixed. You can see the clear highs and lows. And instead of what would normally happen if you mix two pins, is you get a kind of mix of signals. So if I purposely short over two pins, which will crash it, you might just capture at least the first bit of mixed pins. So even though we crash the console, you can see these mixed pins here. So this kind of half pull. And that's when the two pins are fighting each other for drive potential. So that's how you kind of know if it was a bad 
uh, RAM chip, you'd see something like this. So now we know what to look for on um, the other console, because this was the working one. So let's just probe over the RAM chips, which are here, and look for any suspect information. These look all nice, solid square waveforms. And I don't see anything suspect on all of them pins. I've gone around all of them. I just haven't bored you showing you every single pin. But they look perfectly fine. So based on what we know so far, that the screen definitely works. All the pins on here are identical. We've observed that the data pins look wrong. The data pins on the schematic go to these resistors and straight into the Hayato chip. And the Hayato chip is connected to the RAM. Both RAMs have been almost confirmed with guarantee that they are fully functional because the entire game loads and also confirm that they are not video RAM because they crash if you short two data pins on the output, which would typically, especially in the case of a Game Gear, simply alter the display data. So the assumptions where we're up to now on this console is that the Hayato chip is bad. The proof for that now is to get another console and swap the Hayato chip over. So presuming these two are compatible, which normally they are, uh, they don't do any major revisions where swapping these out aren't compatible. Uh, we could hot swap these two over and prove if it is that i'll have to get back to the customer on that because the cost of that is a lot more due to the fact that the hiato chip is effectively the the links itself you can't replace it then it's the console on the positive i could take this in as a donor board which is what i like to do and offer customers that option i know everything else on this board is good and this is all usable parts we've got the suzy chip we've got ram chips we've got a power circuit um it's only the cpu in essence that's bad which obviously is not the best thing to have because you can't see the game so it's not you know, usable, but as a donor board for me, this would be useful to keep. So I can offer the customer either the cost of a chip and effectively donoring, say, a working console, and I've still ended up with a donor board. So I'll take into consideration I'll be left with a donor board I can use, just missing the CPU, and charge them a reasonable price to hot swap it over, which is about half an hour's work plus testing, or they can have it back as a no fix. I'd like to prove this personally because I never like to leave things at a point where, oh, this could be this, but let's not prove it. But this is a customer's board, so I can't just go ahead and swap their CPU without first asking. So I'll leave in the comments what happens with this board and if it does turn out to be the Hayato chip. And I'll also start updating the Retro6.wiki site with all this information. I've got another links to fix right after this, so you'll see another video shortly. But I hope this is useful for you guys. There's very little information out there on the links, and I'm starting to break down and diagnose these more like the Game Gear and update the Retro 6 Wiki site with some really useful information. So I hope you found that interesting. So make sure to drop a comment, even if it's just to say hi or if you have any feedback on improving things. That's it for this one, guys, and I'll catch you in the next.